and welcome to Advantech Embedded Talk. I'm Stephen Liu from Taipei, Taiwan. This Embedded Talk series features interviews and talks given by industry experts in and out of Advantech across the globe, with a special focus on key technologies and use cases such as EV charging and AMR robots from an embedded systems perspective, which includes embedded hardware and of course, software and security. This episode is about opportunities and challenges of the electric vehicle supply equipment or EVSE, that is EV chargers. We are pleased to invite a true expert of the industry, Mr. Jack Ormus, Director of Char in Asia. Charin is the most influential and representative association of EV charging infrastructure around the world, and Advantech just joined Charin this year as a member. Hello and welcome, Jack. Thank you, Stevens. Thank you for having me. So Charin is indeed uh, the organization that develops the techno uh, the technical uh, specifications. Uh, for charging between the car or the battery and the charger and everything that happens beyond the charger. And our members uh, are um, representing all the players from the e-mobility ecosystem. They are not only EV makers, and when I say EV makers, uh, it's not only about cars, it's also about trucks, buses, uh, about airplanes, VTOLs, and uh, anything related to uh, traveling on the sea or uh, underwater. And not to forget also is uh, mining uh, equipment. Then besides these EV players, there is of course uh, the EVSC manufacturers, uh, and another critical player is the charging point operators and also the grid operators because in the end they will have to uh, receive the tools to be able to manage all these uh, batteries that are being charged at the same time. Then you have IT companies that develop uh, software and then you have the hardware companies and uh, last but not least uh, all these uh, testing companies and also standardization organizations. But what is the mission statement of or what's uh, the purpose of this association? Well, why, why, why does it matter so much to the industry? Well, uh, standardization makes sure that any charger coming from any country in the world can be installed anywhere and any EV that is manufactured anywhere in the world can be charged with a charger from anywhere in the world. So equipment coming from Korea uh, EVs coming from Japan being installed in, let's say, in, in Taiwan, they should be able to charge without having any uh, interoperability problems. And that is really the key to success. The second very important part is a single standard. If you're trying to develop e-mobility somewhere in the region and you let the market decide uh, about the charging standard, nothing is going to happen. So it's really important that governments uh, give guidelines to say, OK, we are going to go for this charging standard and then infrastructure will automatically come in because investors now feel confident that they won't have any stranded assets and uh, people buying EVs will also feel confident that the car that they chose will have the right uh, charging standard that will be used for many, many years to come. And that is really a critical part of making sure that e-mobility takes off. And you can see that in many countries where governments decide or give guidelines about the, the, what charging st standard should be used, immediately afterwards you see an exponential increase in uh, installations of uh, chargers and that is then followed uh, by uh, uh, a larger population of EVs entering the market. Once we have decided that a single standard is a key of uh, uh, part of the ecosystem, 
then there are another five uh, elements that come into play. You require fast charging. Fast charging in a sense that uh, you can charge your battery in the same time lapse as filling up the tank of uh, uh, ice car. So I would say within five to 10 minutes, your battery should be able to be recharged in uh, up to 80%. Another uh, part that uh, will help the development of uh, e-mobility is to allow that the different charging point operators can share their uh, assets. A little bit like a mobile phone operator uh, is able that for their customers to start working with another um, uh, telephone operator in case in that region uh, their own uh, operator is not has not a very good uh, network installed. And so this would allow that, for example, charging operators in the north of Taiwan and charging operators in the south of Taiwan uh, would be able to share their infrastructure uh, on a roaming platform. Uh, and that may, may be most important, and that is what many companies forget, is to have cybersecurity. So you need to make sure that all communications from the moment they start uh, communicating between the EV, the battery, and uh, the charger, and also beyond, everything is encrypted. Because uh, if you do not have that, hackers will be attracted to the infrastructure and mess around with uh, this uh, infrastructure uh, in uh, sometimes uh, bad ways. Because they can bring down the infrastructure very easily if it is not a secure uh, operation. Another uh, part that you need to consider is long-term investment. So the long-term investment, why is that uh, important? Because the charging point operators, when they build infrastructure, they do not want to have those stranded assets. So in the one end, this is solved by choosing uh, one standard on a government level. But then there is also the other aspect that you want to you, you want to install chargers that are able to withstand the future. So if you today you still install 50 kilowatt chargers, I can tell you that these are uh, chargers that will not last for a very long time. What you want to install is 180 kilowatt chargers, 350 kilowatt chargers, 400 kilowatt chargers, because these chargers, they might not reach their full potential today, but in two or three time, uh, two or three years, they will be able to provide you uh, with those very short charging times that I'm talking about. And lastly, it also needs to be future ready. So you need to have uh, automated charging systems because uh, driverless cars are coming our way. So with ISO 15118, which is the uh, communication protocol that uh, Charin advocates, you have already the automated charging system in place. Um, you also have wireless uh, charging and then you have smart charging because if you have so many cars or so many batteries being charged at the same time, the grid operator needs to be able to identify which batteries should charge faster, which batteries can slow down charging or even stop charging. Uh, and uh, finally, there is also V2G. So being able to communicate with the grid so that you can build um, a virtual power plant because all these batteries that are sitting in all these cars, they can be used to store uh, renewable energy like wind power and solar power and then release it back to the grid when it is needed. Because there is sunshine in the day, but the grid operator doesn't need much of this energy during daytime. They need it in the evening. So by storing it in batteries and giving it back uh, to the grid uh, when it's really needed, that will solve uh, many of the problems that we have uh, today. So from what you just said, I got a few keywords. First of all, compatibility among different EV chargers or among different uh, CPOs. Second of all, security, 
along with the whole payment uh, data flow uh, and encryption. And then future proof. We want to make sure that these EVSE can last for another five to 10 years. And then finally, integration, because we're going to introduce a lot of state of art technologies like automated charging and so on. So these keywords are also what Advantech feel very strongly about uh, in terms of embedded computing. Uh, in the embedded world, we value compatibility, integration, future proof, and of course, security from the bottom. So that really rings a bell from my side. Now, I've got another question. Uh, people are talking about the growth of EV and, of course, EVSE, but uh, the development of EVSE seems to be rather slow in many places, and a lot of EVSE makers are not making profit. What do you believe is the bottleneck? What are the problems? It is what I mentioned uh, earlier is, uh, first of all, as long as a region doesn't decide about the charging standard, the charging point operators will not invest in that region. So that's a first uh, important uh, point. Then there is also probably the issue that uh, there is competition among EVSE to lower the prices to a level that some companies don't get uh, profitable. But uh, charging point operators have uh, learned a very hard lesson is maybe you install a cheap EVSE, but if that EVSE doesn't implement the ISO 1508 communication protocol in a correct way, charging will not occur. And for every charge that doesn't occur, the charging point operator loses uh, money. And since they already have invested in those, let's say, cheaper chargers, they, they face also a problem. So to avoid this from happening, uh, Charin now is, uh, has developed a system where you get a, a Charin ISO 1508 uh, test certificate that uh, allows the charging point operator to uh, be sure that what they buy as a charger, as an EVSC charger, is really according to the ISO 1511.8 charging standard. And with this, uh, interoperability uh, problems can be uh, avoided. And the same is from the EV side. If you buy uh, a car where there are, uh, where ISO 15118 is not correctly implemented, you will also have um, interoperability problems. And for EV makers, this is a really big problem because as an owner, the first reaction you will have if you don't get a charge is that you'll uh, complain that the car uh, is not uh, charging well. Uh, but it might well be that it's actually the EVSC that is not uh, charging well. So both parties, EVSE makers and EV makers have uh, a lot at stake to make sure that their ISO 1508 is correctly implemented. And it even goes so far that now certain uh, governments will uh, request to have uh, this type of certificate available to be able to give uh, subsidies to the charging point operators. So it seems like that not everybody has uh, its equipment certified by ISO 15.11.8. It's, it's not uh, yeah. everywhere. It's not happening anywhere. Wow. Uh, that's, that's right. Surprising. Yeah, and so we are organizing also testivals. So testivals is where EV makers come with their pre-production car or pre-launch car uh, to test the ISO 15.11.8 against EVSE that also come from all over the world, all over the world and testing takes place uh, in real time. And like this, a lot of errors can be identified. But the testival is, is pretty costly. We organize uh, roughly two uh, uh, testivals 
per year in every region. So in the United States, we have the, uh, two sessions in Europe and in Asia. The next session will take place in Korea at Cary. So for anybody who are uh, listening in right now, uh, April 2024 at Cary, there will be uh, a festival where there will be space for about 20 cars, 20 EVs to be tested against 20 different types of EVSE. And there the makers can identify many of their problems. However, a testival is not as good as uh, uh, the Charin test certificate because with the test, Charin test certificate, the testing that takes place goes really in very deep uh, level into the communication protocol and simulates a lot of errors just to see how the EV reacts and how does the EVSE reacts. And if there is any problem that uh, with the reaction time or the reaction is incorrect, it means this is a fail and the certificate cannot be issued. So Charin is essentially issuing certificates. What is the testing or verification capability within Charin? Do you have a lab or uh, who is doing this for all the uh, EVSE makers? Yeah, so we started with, with identifying labs in uh, 2019. So we have identified two, which have, are now certified to be able to issue those certificates. And uh, this is Gary uh, Center in uh, Korea. And the other one is DECRA in the Netherlands. So we are still looking for uh, another other uh, labs in the region. Uh, to be able uh, to satisfy the demand uh, for those uh, uh, official test certificates. Uh, but due to COVID, uh, it slowed down a little bit. And how long does it take to get a EVSC equipment certified? And is it uh, like a one-off test, like either I, uh, I, I pass or fail, or is it it's more like an interactive consultative process where I can try to improve my product uh, and yeah. discuss with the experts. Yeah, so it really depends on uh, which test you want uh, to do because there are so many tests that can be organized. Uh, for example, there is something called plug and charge, uh, which is a, a software that allows a car to arrive. You plug in, you don't need to scan any QR code or swipe any cards. Automatically, the car is, uh, is uh, identified charging starts, you unplug and the bill is uh, paid. So, and this is a software which is heavy on encryption, is heavy on roaming. And uh, so this is a specific suite that you can uh, request to be tested, or you can go for a basic level. But I would say if you do the testing, uh, it can take two to three days. And if during those two or three days you have a problem, the whole test needs to restart again from zero. So if let's say if it's a testing for two days and the last hour you identify an error, then you have to redo the whole test again after you have updated your software. So it's a very rigorous testing uh, uh, event. Thank you very much indeed, Jack, for your insight and information. We'll be producing more talks like this about key use cases and technologies and trends about particular vertical markets. So do let us know what you think and your challenges and expectations of embedded systems. For more information about Aventex EV charging infrastructure offerings, please check the link below. Thank you and goodbye. Yep. Yeah, bye.